Hey, this is Bill Gladwell, and welcome to episode number 21 of the Hey Look at Me podcast. In this episode, I talk to comedian Scott Novotny. Scott has appeared on Comedy on the Road and MTV's Half Hour Comedy Hour. He headlines comedy clubs throughout the country, and he has opened for such acts as Weird Al, Jay Leno, and Dennis Miller. Scott and I talk about living in LA, writing for SNL, hell gigs, bringing the audience to you, working with Penn and Teller, and Pee Wee Herman at Prince's Party. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. And when you do leave a five-star review, I would really appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bill Gladwell, and you can jump on my website with any questions or comments at BillGladwellLive.com. So enjoy episode 21 of the Hey Look At Me podcast. Today we got Scott Novotny. Hey, that would be me. I know, and what, what ethnicity, I guess? What's Novotny? What's... Um, it's a last name. That's what it is. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, it's, it's, uh, actually comes from, uh, as I've gone on the internet to find out, it's a, it's a, a Czech bohemian name. And you know what it means? It meant, it, Novotny, people are, are you related to the Novotnys and Rice Lake? Are you related to, no, I'm not related to any of these people. I'm related to, I went, I grew up in Mayo Clinic, Minnesota. That's where I grew up. And that was my little tribe of Novotnys there. And uh, in fact, my, my birth spelling is Novotny with an E, not with a Y, but the traditional spelling on the botany is with a Y, and that's why I use it for the stage, because uh, most MCs cannot pronounce the botany with the Y, and then you put just an E and a Y on it, and they don't know what to do with it, and then it becomes Nova Tone, Nova Da, Nova, Nova. Well, I gave up when I was going up to to Duluth to perform in uh, Grandma's Supper Club. I'm driving up there. I'm listening to the radio, and it says, Tonight, headlining Grandma's Supper Club, Scott Novellini. Scott Novellini <laughs> will be here tonight. And I'm like, God, now I'm a pasta dish. So um, I said, I better just change my name to a Y. So Novotny in uh, Czech Bohemia means the new guy in town. If you were a Novak or a Novotny, um, and the, there was a couple other terms for the new guy in town. They called you the, uh, hey, oh, you're the, you're the Novotny, you're the Novak. And so consequently, in uh, in the Czech Bohemian area, the tons of Novotnys, because there was always a new guy moving into town in these villages and stuff like that. So they were called Novotnys. And if you had a, a, a spouse that per, that died, you would have become, you would drop the Y and you put an E or an A in Novotna or Novotny. So it's all this interesting thing about the last name, but uh, for the most part, it's just just uh, Scott Novotny. That is what it is. Yeah. Awesome. You're originally from Minnesota. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in Minnesota. I grew up in Rochester, and uh, um, I spent most of my uh, career in the Minneapolis uh, market area. I did spend three years out in L.A. I lived in the Valley, dude. I was in Sherman Oaks, you know, like, you know. What took you to L.A.? Uh, to, to try it, you know. You were going to go gonna either New York or you're going to go to L.A. Yeah, L.A. had more said. of a sitcom market, and uh, I thought I'd go that way, so I'd give it a try. Um, I was out there for about three years with my ex, and when I divorced her, she went on to do some nice things. I mean, I had a kind of feeling. I said, you know, Stephanie, her name is Stephanie Hodge, and she was uh, she she was on Nurses. She was on Unhappily Ever After. Um, I said, as soon as you they find out that you're single, because you're this babe, you know, and uh, they're going to find out that you're not attached to anybody, watch watch what happens to your career and I was like boom sure enough but uh, same thing happened for you though right no yeah I went <laughs> I went the other way but you know what um, I went out to kind of go clear my head and then once I got back to the Midwest I said you know I think I think I kind of did my thing it's it's really fun out there but it's uh, uh, it, you really have to put your war paint on and I, I was one of these guys that just wanted to perform and I, I, I you know just I'm good. Come on, just 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 grab me, take me, do something with me. But you have it's got to be more than just your Midwest faith and uh, that your, your talent. You have to you got to get in there and you got to dig in and you got to you know you have to you do the seminars and the workshops and classes and all the things. I mean, I was headlining in the Midwest and then when I get to L.A., I'm standing in line to get on an open stage at the the comedy store. And the first time I did that, I didn't even get in because the line was so long and you have to get in there at a certain time to get. Just I think at three o'clock in the afternoon you have to sign up for the thing, and then the second time I actually got down there early enough and I got on and I'm going to do the comedy store and I've got a really nice time right around nine thirty. It was like really good. The place was packed and of course as soon as the the regulars sniffed out that the audience was really good, they just kept putting the regulars on 
on on and it kept bumping us open stagers till finally I was on at one o'clock with seven people you know so wow. yeah I know I know um, but you learn a lot I mean it's humbling to go out to do to be headlining and then to go out and be back on the open stage market and back and you know starting all over again it's all about networking though really if I was to tell comics I said you know if you go out to LA and you want to perform at the comedy store on an open stage your material will probably stay there as you leave to go back to Indiana or Ohio, wherever you are, because they they, they will say, "Come on up, he's just in town for the you know, for the weekend." Here he is. It's so and so from Indiana, and boom, all the the notepads come out, and those those guys are writing down your best material. I had a friend of mine who uh, performs in my show called uh, "Kick the Bucket List" or "The World According to ARP." It's uh, the show I've been presenting um, for. It's a it's a neat show. It talks about getting older with a sense of humor. It's a stand up comedy show with a theatrical framework. Well, Dean did, went and did that same exact thing two weeks later on the Tonight Show, verbatim, word for word. There, one of his best lines was was delivered right there on the Tonight Show. So I always tell when I I teach stand up comedy classes and I go, you know, if you're going to go out to L A, you might as well just go out and watch and just absorb it all. But don't don't think about trying to get on because you're, nothing's going to happen for you. No one's going to pick you up on the open stage. You're not going to get a, a TV sitcom. All you're doing doing is going. Here's my material. Who wants it? You know, and that's kind of how it goes. So you, do you not? I would have guessed you don't go to L.A. or New York until you're ready to go to L.A. or New York. Yeah, you pretty much, that's, it's, yeah, yeah. And then it, unless you want to be a writer, maybe that's, I mean, most of the, now most you of did my, write, friend, you know, right? I did, I've done writing all my life. Yeah. It's just been bits and pieces here and there. Whenever I want to sit down and actually write something out, I usually want to do something with it. Um, I got a little bit of material written on Saturday Night Live back in the, gosh, way back in the Eddie Murphy years, only because I'm, I'm that's new, early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, way. how do you even how do you even do something like that? Well, you know somebody. That's what it is. Well, my uh, when I first started out, I started out as a comedy duo called the Amalgamated Amusement Company. We were the AA Coke, who wanted to be first in the Yellow Pages. Back when Yellow Pages were relevant, and um, so Gail and I knew each other in college, and she was very funny, and we both had improv background, even though improv still wasn't. You know, none of this. I mean, back in the 80s, back in the late 70s, there weren't comedy clubs. I mean, that's how long I've been doing this thing. I mean, we were literally uh, doing the, well, let's get an act together, put some chairs up in the living room, invite some friends and have them come over and see if any of this is, you know, can work or not. And um, uh, it's such an interesting story, actually. Uh, we went to Gustavus Adolphus College and uh, we worked for about a year together. I, I taught high school for two years. Um, what did you right, teach? Uh, I taught 7th and 8th grade English out of uh, Dassel Coquito High School in Minnesota. Yeah. Well, that's a mouthful. Yes. 7th seven, <laughs> seven and 8th grade English. I consider that my, my two years to my country. Some of my friends went to Nam. I did two years. <laughs> and those are that's the hard age is 7th and 8th grade. You know, it's really funny about it. Now, here I am many, many years later, and this is back in, what, 76, 77, and uh, I probably have... 30 to 40 of my uh, students from Dassel Crocato come back, are, are following me on Facebook. I mean, they really remembered me as a teacher. And I really wanted, I mean, I love teach. actually I really like teaching a lot. And they let me uh, direct the plays and things. I directed The Music Man and I directed uh, Oliver and some fun stuff. The, the, the kids were great. Um, I like doing that much more than I like teaching. Teaching, I, was, I, was, I, I must have been better than I thought I was because the students still remember who I am. But I decided that was, uh, there was this newfangled thing called stand-up comedy. I wanted to give it a try. And so I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. And the superintendent of schools pushed my resignation back. He said, no, 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 you're a big, you know, big fish in a little pond here. And uh, you're going to go to Minneapolis and you're going to get all eaten up by, you know, you're, you just stay right here. I go, no, 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 you're not me. He wouldn't let me resign. He wouldn't let me. I thought that well, was pretty wait, funny. I think we jumped ahead. How did you decide that you wanted to go from teaching to stand-up comedy? Well, there's the, okay. Well, I, it kind of gets to the question okay. that you're, that you, uh, about Saturday Night Live, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to get there in kind okay. of a weird back. back. So um, I'm teaching uh, out of school. Well, Gail calls me, and Gail is, uh, she's uh, being like a secretary for these agents out in, in Minneapolis, and uh, the, all these folk singers uh, like Michael Johnson and Sean Phillips and people you probably don't know who they are, but they're kind of big in the Minneapolis area. They're all looking for uh, this new thing called stand-up comedy to open for them in concerts. And they're looking for They don't have any. There's hardly anybody around. So I said, well, it would be fun. I'd love, we'd be, we'd, let's get together and figure something out. So we would get together on the weekends and we would work on a little comedy sketch 
kind of a thing. We were like a duo. Well, we listened to Nichols and May and, and Stiller and Mara and all these albums, and we were looking at joke books, and we didn't know what we were doing. You know, we are just trying to create some something fun for, you know. Uh, and uh, um, one of the agents said, well, let's give this a try. And so he, he booked Gail and I after we got to, we'd been together just working on some stuff for about seven months. And uh, he said, I've got a, I've got a booking for you in uh, Springfield, South Dakota at a, at a tech school in an auditorium. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, we got paid. The first time I ever did stand-up comedy ever, I got paid like 500 bucks. And uh, teaching back then, I was probably making 300 bucks a week. Now and 500 is really good back then. Back then, that was incredible. It's well, really good now for some comics. I, I'm quitting. I'm quitting teaching right then and there, aren't I? I mean, you think about it. I mean, yeah. it's like that's so. So I said, Gail. I said, so I quit teaching, and we got together, and uh, we started with two 45-minute sets. Um, somehow we got through that that Springfield, South Dakota thing, um, and we get enough and got just enough laughs to we were we were horrible, probably. <laughs> I mean, we were probably horrible. Um, and back then, there's you, no no tapes, no no <laughs> tapes, no nothing back. You didn't have any of that kind of junk back then. Um, that was that's real to real that's time. That's right. Yeah, we're back in real. I had one days. of those growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, or Super Eight, you know. And uh, so that didn't that wasn't going to happen. But we <laughs> but we said that was really cool. So we uh, uh, about a year later, we had about 28 minutes after you know getting rid of all the other stuff that. We, did, we realized you got to write this stuff yourself. You know, you can't just be taking other people's stuff. So we had about 28 minutes. And we so there was a little comedy club called Mickey Finn's in, in Minnesota. That was the first kind of little one-night thing that, um, you know, to, to do stand-up comedy. And so we did that. And uh, we were working there. And then I uh, uh, I was uh, auditioning for, uh, I was actually workshopping at an um, improvisational workshop called Dudley Riggs Brave New Workshop. It's like the, the second city of the Twin Cities. It's okay. a big, big, big deal there. And I'd seen a couple of shows and I was like, God, if I could just work here. Oh, if I could do improv, it would be like, that would be the end. I, I, that'd be it. I, I would love to do this. Like, this is this is it for me. So, and I got it. I got I got the part in the regular company. And uh, so Gail went out to uh, L.A. Um, with her, her boyfriend, fiance, who was writing scripts for Remington Steele at the time. This guy was, wow. already, he was already doing well. That's the 80s, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was in the 80s. Well, no, it's, yes. Was it? Yes, it was early late eighties or early eighties, late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, 80s. Remington Steel. Late seventies, early eighties. Um, so Gail went out. We took all of her material and, and combined it into a, a one woman act for her, so that she could perform her material, our our material together. And um, and so she, and she went to the store and she had all these weird characters and fun things. Well. The, the 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 people from Saturday Night Live would just gotten the, all the 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 old guys. You know, the regular company had just quit. They didn't know what they were going to do with Saturday Night Live. They decided to do a brand new Saturday Night Live with Gilbert Godfrey, Charles Rock, and Joe Piscopo, uh -huh. uh, Denny Dillon. Well, Gail Mathias got picked up, and my comedy party got picked really? up. So um, we took all of our material that we had been written, written and we sent it off with Gail out to New York. And so they, we, they pieced through the stuff, pieced through the stuff. And one of my sketches made it all the way through. And my uh, fraternity jacket from college made it for an entire season there because she wore it as one of her characters. Do you ever go back to season six? On, um, oh, I watch them uh, because that's one of the best seasons. Uh, uh, that that, that was, whole era. No, it was horrible until uh, until uh, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. And Eddie Murphy was he was writing at the beginning of it, and then he came on board to yes. be, and he saved that season. Yeah, I mean, it really wasn't going anywhere. It was. I mean, I watch it. And I just. I, mean, I cringe. I go. Oh, I watch God. it now, and I, I maybe it's a generational thing, but I don't. I don't think they're funny now. I, I like the late seventies and early eighties stuff, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, and oh, actually, all the way through the '80s because I graduated I, in '89. What's fun so. about Saturday Night Live is to watch. It goes in like, like, like pulses, like a like a pulse. There'd be this good group of people for a while, and then like right now, I don't even know if I could name anybody that's. I on. can't. No, you know, not right now. I could. Nope. But you know, they just had a nice little wave of really funny people that just you know did some nice stuff. And uh, it, it 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 does. It goes in these little little. little I watch it if there's somebody that I want to see that's going to be on it, like uh, Louis C.K. Right. Was on it, so I watch his monologue, and I couldn't watch anymore. I, I turn it off after the first skit. It was that was it. I just wanted to see his monologue. Yeah. 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 I, I saw that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> I, I I got what he was doing. Yeah. You know. You know. And, and that's what I told Summer, my wife. I said he didn't do it on accident. That was uh, that mm -hmm. was a purposeful thing. He, oh, yeah. And he's probably the only one that could walk out there right now and do that. And uh, it was it was really good. Yeah, that's that's pushing it right to where you know where most of us wouldn't dare go ever. You know, <laughs> and I, I appreciate it. I mean, I really like uh, Louis C.K. a lot. Yeah. I mean, I I just look at him and go. He's just so 
himself honest and it's just and brilliant sometimes i mean just brilliant um really really like him a lot so, my but my mentors were like steve martin and that i yeah. love i saw steve martin in a little 200 seat theater in minneapolis before he his rise did he walk you outside no, he didn't go outside. He used but to do that. You know, it was funny. He he when he came on, he was just him walking on the stage was a five minute event. When he left the stage, it took him five minutes to leave the stage through the audience. He did. He played off the. I mean, it was he. He was so funny, and I wish to tell people. Hey, this, I saw Steve Martin. They go, who? I go, just trust me. I mean, just trust me. This guy's going to be huge. He's just like incredible. So it. Meanwhile, well, anyway, that's how I ended up getting to write for Saturday Night Live. It was through Gail, through our material, through all the story that that uh, that entails to get that stuff out. But it was really something. I'm sitting in Minneapolis, and I'm not really getting credit for it. But there's my stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm and there's Gail doing my stuff, and it's like it was so cool to be able to sit there and go. Millions of people right now are watching, and it's stuff that came from my head that they're watching right now. It's pretty neat. Cool. I mean, it's a pretty it neat moment. You know? Did you get your jacket back? No. No, because I had the cast sign it and get it back. Oh, that would. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I just I have I have it on tape and I uh, have it on pictures. So I go, that's you know, that's really cool. We had Richie Byrne from New York on uh, the podcast early on, and he was talking. I believe it was him. If I'm mistaken, sorry, Richie. He said I think his brothers went out. And then they came home one night and said, oh, we saw this comedian, this black comedian that was, his name is Eddie Murphy, and you got to see him. And he was just getting started. And I said, man, and, and then Steve Martin, I would have loved to see. I would have picked Steve Martin over Eddie Murphy. I like Eddie Murphy too, but Steve Martin, I would have loved to see him. Well, those, when he those was guys off. became concerts. I mean, that was n- unheard of. A concert comedian, you know, most Steve Martin and Eddie Murphy. Richard Pryor became concert comedian. And Bill, Bill Cosby even back there. Yeah, yeah well, Bill Cosby was like you know, one of the first. But yeah, we used to listen to his record albums as kids all the time. We, so did I. So we did had I. tons of his stuff. It was great. Yeah, love that stuff. But when I first started out, I lip synced to record albums. That was my big. Uh, cl- that's how I started. I was. Uh, I started on the Cancer Telethon in Rochester, Minnesota. I lip synced to Hello Mudda, Hello Father by Alan Sherman. Yeah, I and, taught the kids that recently. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> and we had a. I had a blast doing it and I, I had a whole bunch of songs because somebody came in to do a, um, like a mini pearl thing for one of my uh, and, she, and then she sold like stuff afterwards you know and then so my mother decided to do like Tupperware and so then I kind of opened for my mother's Tupperware parties I would be the you know and I had a song from uh, Mad Magazine called It's a Gas which is nothing but like burping and so it led perfectly into Tupperware obviously <laughs> but uh, um, so I would do about four or five you know, lip sync things and get the get the, the ladies all warmed up and then I'd let my mom do her, her thing with her Tupperware how and, old were you at that time? Oh, 11 <laughs> yeah I was, I've been in this business a long time I've been, I've been in front of people I've known that I wanted to be something I didn't know it was stand up comedy but I knew comedy and performing is what I wanted I've wanted that for forever so this is you know people go how do you know? Everybody comes into stand-up comedy differently. I mean, that's there's no one path that gets you to stand-up. It's it's a it's always an incredibly weird route, uh, like an etch a sketch kind of route to get there. And then you finally there, you know, you know. And then it's you got to be on stage and you have to perform and you have to do all the venues. You have to do the the little bars. You got to you end up in Wednesday in in Kearney, Nebraska on a Wednesday night, and you walk on stage and there's a pole right in the middle of the stage, so you kind of know what kind of a club is on the weekend there. <laughs> but you just perform. I said, boy, the the, the the ladies in this audience are awfully attractive for a, a Wednesday in Kearney, Nebraska. Um, so it's did a, you was your stage name Destiny when you went up? So. It should have been. It should have been. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Be, well, see, I've been a fan of stand up comedy for a very long time. Um, I've been to comedy clubs all over the U.S. And uh, uh, when you were up on stage one night, I said I sat in Dangerfields in New York City, where it was me and then another couple. And they still made the comic go up on stage. And I said, man, that was a tough, both for the audience and for the comic up on stage. And so I love stand-up comedy. And I I don't know if I, I, I guess I could do it if I set my mind to it. But what I do is a little bit I, different. I had that same experience. I was in Chicago uh, watching a, a comedians. And uh, there was a whole group of us. Uh, or, I mean, just me and Stephanie, I think, was back at the time. And we were sitting there. 
and uh, the the audience basically got up and left after they saw this one guy that they wanted to see, leaving me and Stephanie there. And then Paul Kelly, I don't know if you know who he is, comes on stage and he's starting to do his act for the two of us. And I just said, Paul, just we can talk if you want, because <laughs> you don't have to do your comedy act to get for two people. I'm sorry, but you know. And then I started talking, and we just ended up talking. And it was a lot more a lot more fun than him attempting to do stand up comedy for the two of us. And that's, it was it happens sometimes. You have small crowds. You have to learn how to play those. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to play small crowds, and and you you can't they can't always be these nice big huge crowds. It, it doesn't always happen that way. But do you have a gig? that stands out as like it was bad i mean not because you were bad but the position that you were put in was how many and just yeah just <laughs> one many? you have one that stands out <laughs> how many i mean you know most often it's just a, it's not that your act is bad it's just usually the environment that you're put in that particular chemistry that particular equation just isn't going to work right yeah you know um the one that always stands out for me is uh was uh at fargo north dakota they had a rib fest and they decided to do stand-up comedy in the afternoon, during a work week, by the way. So 3.30 in the afternoon, they've got these tents set up out on the tarmac, out on the you know the, the car lot. It's 95 degrees, which makes it probably 110. It's just, that's way hot for North Dakota, by the way. So I'm on stage in this little, uh, I don't know what it would be called, um, just... I'm on this little stage, and there's nobody there. And I mean nobody. Every, if, if you're eating ribs, you're in a tent someplace, nobody's outside. Okay. So I said, well, why don't I just do the second show uh, later tonight in front of the band, and there'll be people there. So that'd be great. She goes, no, nope, contract, do it. I go, but just, it's, I'm not, I don't have a guitar. I'm not just playing stuff. I'm doing stand-up in front of people. That's how it works. No, it's in your contract. So I stood there and performed for nobody, you know, in, in this you know, and the thing of it is, I had to do it again the following day because I knew I was under contract for for two shows the following day. Same thing, so I get out there again, and uh, once again, nobody there. And I know that there's people if they're in tents. So I said, "How long is this cord? How long can I stretch this cord?" So I stretch it to a tent. I open up the back of the tent. I put myself in. There's like this fam, two family eating ribs, and I look. You're my audience, so you could hear me. You couldn't see me anywhere, but I'm in this. I'm in a tent talking to some people. I said, "There's no way I'm not going to do this show again for nobody." It's really humiliating to be stuck in a situation where you just know that it's just it's fail. You know? Yeah, it's really hard to do crowd work too yeah. when you don't have a crowd. Well, you need you need folks. You can't you can't do the show. Oh my! Yeah, my my show. You mean? Yeah. No, I can't. I need my full show. I use 22 victims. Yeah. That's what I call them in the yeah. show, and so. Uh, I can't do it without that. But, but I, that was one of the worst ones, uh, you know. Um, sometimes, like in a corporate event, they uh, over plan where they have. A, I'll give you an example. I was in uh, Lincoln, it was Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, and it was for um, the the Gecko. What's the what's the oh Geico Geico Yeah. No, it wasn't. No, it was the was what, it Geico? Who's the who's the duck? What's the oh duck? the duck Affleck Affleck. Okay, so. Yeah. Affleck, big deal. They've got the seminars all day long. The big, huge, uh, the open bar, so the, everybody can drink as much as they want to, which is not, oh, never a good sign. And then uh, they had a, so they had the social hour, and then they had a big dinner, and then they had awards, and the, the thing just stretched on and on. Then they had a motivational speaker that came on and did like an hour and fifteen minutes, and this audience was spent. They were done and then they said and now our stand-up comedian i'm walking on the stage in an entire auditorium 300 people basically get up and leave it's like a reverse standing ovation as they they just uh-huh. they just fled i don't care if i could have been jerry seinfeld they, they would have just gotten up and just left i mean to the point there were probably 30 people scattered in the auditorium and you know it's stuff like that you just have to you finally after so many years of this i finally just said this is what it is, and I can't, I can't go home and take it personally. But I tell you what, the bad shows are probably where I learn more than anything. Oh, absolutely. I, if yeah. I have a good show, I'll tend to go to Tennessee, right, right back to the hotel room, just kind of relax. But I have a bad show, I go back, I'll start writing. Go, what can I have done to change that around? What can I have done to, to, to do that a little differently than I did? And then I, I, I learn a lot more from my bad shows than my good shows. But fortunately, I don't have them too often. Yeah, that's good. Nice, yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I, I they do corporate work. I've done it for years. And re- just recently, I had a corporate gig that hired me out. I had 600 attorneys, and they had their spouses there too. 
but the room was so large and the ceiling was so high and they had me talking through the house system in the hotel, the conference center. And it was with the echoes and everything. Yeah. I couldn't hear myself and they couldn't hear me. I mean, no matter where you're at, they just it all crossed. The waves crossed and you couldn't hear me. And uh, it was really hard to do a show like that. Yeah, I've been in those bouncy situations yeah. too. I just, you go, hmm, yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it but no. do the show. Yeah. And so I had, I was really playing to the first two rows is all I could really play to because they could hear me just without the mic. And uh, I don't know what they heard in the back, but they were talking. You could hear them in the back yep. talking. It was oh, yeah. really bad. So the scene between L.A., because you were there for three years, did mm -hmm. you say, and Minneapolis or Minnesota in general, how different is that? Well, you know, in, in uh, L.A., every time you can get a possible showcase, it's a big deal. I mean, so uh, to get we, we used to perform downtown in L.A. at the Variety Arts Center on, on Ed Wynn's drum. That was the stage. Ed Wynn's drum down in this basement. Um, right downtown at the uh, Variety Arts Center. And upstairs, we were, uh, they had a band like the Butthole Surfers were playing up there. So we're down in the basement. And it's all these comics you're looking for. If you can get a Friday or Saturday night, I mean, just to perform on a Friday or Saturday night and you're new, you, you take it. You know, so we're, we're performing for basically for drinks. You know, we're not getting any money on this. But um, in that group of people that I was working with at the time, there was uh, these guys, you've probably heard of them, Judd Apatow, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Paul Feig. Um, these people who became directors and producers were all started in this little area. Um, uh, and uh, we just, we would perform there. And it was really interesting to, I mean, that you, you just weren't, you just couldn't get, you're waiting in line to perform in, in L.A., in, in Minnesota, in th these markets, you th there's not very much competition, so you're getting a lot of stage time in the Midwest. So if er anybody ever wants to start, you you start in the Midwest. Uh, you know, uh, don't go to LA until your act is you you. It's not only solid, but you have the publicity, you have the photos, you have you have it all. You're ready to go, and you are you, know, you have enough friends out there that are ready to you know and you use your friends you don't go i really should call them but i don't really want to bug them you know no you go bug your friends you go bug i them. do that i still do that yeah and they bug me yeah you can't i'm okay you, with you, it you can't be just the nice guy thing you just have to get in there and 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 uh you know take your shot at it and then be ready when the opportunity hits yeah and recognize it mm -hmm. so you're in minnesota now but not for long right no, I'm heading to uh, L.A., and that's, uh, I'm not out to, to Florida. Back to L.A.? I didn't think you were going to no. L.A. again. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking of something else. Uh, Florida, and I think, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, I have some connections there, but it's uh, it's for health reasons. I'm, I'm recently remarried, and uh, my wife's got some health issues that require her to be in a warm climate. So we're going down there for her. For uh, that's, the, for, that's the initial. But as I go, you take lemons, and you make lemonade out of it, and I think it's going to be really interesting down there. Now I can't wait to get down there. I've got a little older and uh, the baby boom generation is still out there looking for entertainment and things to do I've got a very clean act so people like to watch my show one of my favorite things is uh, when people come up and go really appreciate the fact that you could do comedy and it's not dirty and that I which I really like about your club here is that the the comedians that you're you're having here are are clean comedians mm -hmm. for the most part from what I understand no and, they all are yeah well except for one that we had issues with but yeah for the most part they're yeah all clean. and uh there were a rare breed out there, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's, you, you know, there's a, a ton of working comics, but there's a, there's a ton of working comics that can't do what I'm doing, that can't do what you're doing, because they don't work it that way. They, they work it, you know, it's, it's much easier to go dirty than it is to go clean. Now, much easier. Oh, it is, absolutely. So now, does it really matter where you live at now? Kind of not. Okay. You know, it, what only matters is that transportation costs a little bit more. Instead of spending 30 bucks for gas, now I'm spending 400 and 450 bucks to get myself there you know so That's right. you know yeah. it, it changes the the, the the amount of money that i'm going to end up making but um my goal is to probably to, to try to do the cruise ship market i think that would be a, a fun market to do um a lot of people say oh you know you're a cruise ship comic i i, I don't know what that even means yet so you, know, you can't if, if this is a if this is a cruise ship audience here that's what everybody tells me this is like a cruise ship audience is what other comics do and i won't have any problem yeah. because this is this is a great room and it's a lot of fun because we got 100 percent I think we, have we had any locals since you've been here? Uh, three, maybe. Three. Yeah, so a hundred, um, close to a hundred percent of tourists, and that's what you're looking at on a cruise ship. So if if you're if you're coming to see stand up comedy here, you know, in you know Hilton Head Island, this is a great place to come because you you know the because the locals don't talk about local stuff here because there aren't you know you it's all 
And that's the nice thing about being a touring stand-up comic. You know, I've toured almost all over the United States, and I can get myself around to in, in many, many cities. I mean, I just know my way around Omaha and Lincoln and uh, L.A. and uh, I, I, not New York. I can't do New York. I've done very little work out in New York. But um, I do like New York. Yeah. I just don't want to drive in New York. Yeah, no. <laughs> I have before. It's really bad. So. Well, let me ask you this, because I, I did the opposite. And what I, I mean, I do both now, but I did corporate work and I did uh, private events. And I did that for 20 years, and I had a stage comedy hypnosis show, and I moved it over to the mentalism show now. So I was traveling. It was like a traveling comic. I was on the road quite a bit, a lot. Yeah. Then I flipped it and moved to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I found a place where the audiences change instead of me having to change the city. I did that for three years and then moved it down here, and the same thing here. It's a tourist spot. Have you ever given it any thought to find a spot that the audiences come to you instead of you going to them? Is that something that you would want to well, do? Well, I started a comedy club in Minneapolis. I, I ran, it was the first comedy, real comedy club uh, back in 1980 to 85. It was called the Comedy Cabaret. And my uh, goal there was to kind of recreate vaudeville a bit. I really wanted to do much of stand-up comedy, which, which, which was the kind of the thing. But I really wanted to bring in anybody that was interesting. Um, so I had, I had magicians and jugglers and uh, transvestite. Uh, you know, uh, I had, if you were interesting at all, I would put you on the stage. I brought in Pee Wee Herman before anybody thought to bring him in. I bought him. I was the first person ever to bring Pee Wee. Now, was he doing Pee Wee at the time? He was doing Pee Wee. I saw him on the HBO special called the Pee Wee Herman Show. He was an actor at the Groundlings Theater at the time, but he didn't didn't think he could do anything with that you know, character other than that little show. And I just called him up. I, I got his number from Penn Gillette, of all people. Um and, uh, and I, how do you know Penn? Because we talked about that a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting story, too. I was uh, out at the Ren Fest in Minneapolis, and uh, they were working on their show because they had lost their musician, and they were called the Asparagus Valley Cultural Society before yep. they became Penn and & Teller. And so they were kind of didn't know what to do with the, without the, that mu those musical interludes that would kind of help them with their show. And they was were, Teller talking at the time? No. No, I mean, I think from the very start, that was the no. He was that was the going agreement to be, they had, yeah. You know, Harpo Marx, basically. Yep. You know, it was it, that was a very interesting choice, um, and they're wonderful guys, really smart. I mean, I, I I don't I don't know what I know them now, but they would know who I am if I you know bumped into them. They go, hey, they're still nice people. I yeah. I ran into Teller uh, a couple of years ago and ran into well, they go outside and they meet everybody. And the funny thing is with them is because the reason they meet everybody outside of the the showroom at the casino is because when they had their show in New York, they had to leave before the audience and it was they there was only one door out and there was no backstage. So they had to go out and they met everybody because everybody passed them mm -hmm. and they just kept doing that when they went to Vegas. Well, I, I saw them at the Renfest, and I said, well, why don't you come out to my comedy club and work out your, you know, you know, you know. so they did. They came out and worked. Uh, they opened for Puke and Snot, of all people, the, uh, the, the, the jousting duo that's very popular in the Minnesota area. A uh, jousting duo. Yeah, duo. a jousting duo. Yeah. And they were uh, at that point in the Renfest where people would come to uh, – uh, they were so far they're so far away they could hardly see them. I mean, they were literally – that huge at the Rent Fest. The Puke Snot was like the big deal. Really? So they said, this way you get to see them up close and personally get to actually hear them. Wait, what did they do at the comedy club then? They did their show, uh, but they did it on stage and they kind of, they jousted or, uh, they don't do that much jousting. It's mostly jesting. Oh, got it. Okay. So I mean, they weren't on horses or anything right no, now. Oh, no. okay. No, right. It's mostly a sword play. And okay. I, I said jousting, but it's mostly just um, sword play. I had a whole different image in my mind with no, horses on the I'm stage in the comedy club. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. More, more of that kind of like, it's a lot you know, of cleanup. <laughs> Epies and you know, things you use in crossword puzzles. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, and so they opened. Yeah, so Puke and Snot uh, had uh, Penn and Teller open for them. So that was their big claim to fame. Is that they? But Penn and Teller took that show that they worked out at my club and they went out to L.A. and they you know just never never looked back after that. Um, so it was really fun to get to know them. Well, Penn happened to know uh, uh, Paul Rubens, who was Pee Wee Herman. Right. And he had his number, and I so I called him up. I said I said hey, I got this little theater that looks like uh, little rascals when they used to do shows in their garage. That's what it looks like. And uh, he said, well, I've only got about 15 minutes. I said, I don't care. We'll build a whole show around you. We think you're great. So uh, we, I, I, we, I, we told the, the audience that he was coming. Um, the place is sold out immediately. We added two shows, sold out immediately. I mean, we had people literally camping. In because our, of the HBO in our lobby. special we had. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was huge. And he had no idea. He had no idea. It was really? Like, yeah, literally. Well, I guess you I literally see the social light bulb, media the light wasn't bulb. around no, back then. So no. you wouldn't know. No, yeah. he was in L.A. writing Pee Wee's Big Adventure, kind of. Didn't know really what he wanted to do. He left knowing that 
something had clicked, something big had happened. You got to watch that. It was really pretty neat. I mean, that was a neat moment to go, to see him go, I had no idea. And, and you know, and it was funny because I was at the, uh, um, the Igby's Comedy uh, Cabaret in uh, L.A. when I was in L.A., and I'm sitting here talking to this guy wearing a fedora, and uh, he's... Uh, and he's talking, you know, and he goes, oh, we have a special guest coming. Let's bring on Bobcat Goldthwait. The guy goes, excuse me, and takes his hat off, hair goes down. I go, I've just been talking to Bobcat Goldthwait. I had no idea. Well, he came back afterwards and said, I didn't know you. And he started talking. He said, oh, I know who you are. You're the guy that gave Pee Wee Herman his start. He went, so word had gotten around. I went, oh, I didn't really. It's, but anyway, it was cool. So uh, it, it, it's uh, it's such a fascinating world out there. I'm, I'm so glad to have been part of it and gotten to meet yeah, no a number of these neat, neat people. People like and Joan Rivers, Jay Leno. I actually picked up Jay Leno. I, I brought him into my club before he, he became big. I said, this guy's going to be really funny. I had a Le Car at the time. He was about as big as my car, <laughs> and his luggage barely fit with him in it. And uh, it was pretty funny to, to, to drive Jay Leno around town to motorcycle shops. That's what he wanted to see back then. He was really into motorcycles. Um, neat, funny, oh, funny He still guy. is. He, I think he still is. Funny, yeah. funny man. All the, on, on all the time, but not in a bad way. Really, just yeah. fun, funny guy. And Bobcat, go for Wait, he uh, does independent films and uh, writes them and films yep. them and produces them, yep. and he also does documentaries. And he was best friends with Robin Williams, and I just heard him on the Nerdist podcast with Chris Hardwick, and uh, it was on the anniversary, one year anniversary of uh, of uh, Robin's death, and uh, so they were talking about him. But he, uh, you know, everybody knew him from the police, uh, academy. police academy and that's not who he is but i mean he actually he milked it for a while yeah. at the clubs with that but that's, i don't i don't think his voice would have held out doing that guy it was no just, well, sam kennison he his voice held out for a while longer yeah it was a well just doing p i mean the, when i i do peewee on stage a little bit and that just wrecks my voice so just i mean when paul off stage talks like this he has like no voice really yeah he talks very because I mean, all he's using his entire voice to, to do that that crazy character. It's it's really hard on your voice. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I know they're bringing him back again. I know Netflix has got a, a Pee Wee Herman movie that they're making. So um, do they really? Yeah, a brand new one. Um, I said he. I said when I was we were driving. It was funny. He, he was flown into uh, uh, Minneapolis to go to Prince's birthday party. And they, Pee Wee Herman was. I see. I've had dinner with Prince before. He's. A, I'm a fan of Prince, so I like him oh, a lot. That's cool. But it's. Uh, that's but, so. But, Prince is a fan of Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and enough to fly him in. So, so Paul's driving around town in uh, in a in a one of Prince's limos, and of course everybody you know can't see through the window, so they they're thinking it's Prince's, you know. But so we're in this limo with Paul, and we're driving around the the um, the, the lakes, and uh, Paul's going, I could buy almost any of these houses right now, and he was like, This is amazing. It's amazing, you know, from where he came in and then like six months later when he came back. And so the, the Pee Wee Herman movie was just about ready to open. And I said, and he was getting tired of the character. And I said, no, no, not yet. No, I said, you had to do like like two, like the third movie is what you do. With the third, never got to the third movie. I said, the third movie, you'd be Pee Wee, but meet all these characters like uh, Danny Kaye used to do and, and Jerry Luce used to do where he, he'd play all these other characters in the in the film so that the audience gets the idea that you can be all these different people, you know? Yeah. So then after that, then it won't matter because they go, oh, he's not, he's not only just Pee-wee, but he's an actor as well. And then you go do whatever you want to do. But at least go through the third one because you're going to have, I bet you you'll get the cover of Rolling Stone. I bet you anything which he did. I said, you'll probably have a comic book. I mean, you'll probably have a TV show. I mean, all these things are going to happen for you. You you don't quit, you know, sure enough. I mean, almost all that stuff happened. Um, I don't think you got the comic book, although I think that would have been probably a, a good comic book. For, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, it was it was pretty fun to watch, watch that whole thing. And then uh, when he, he came back to Minneapolis again, but then the Guthrie Theater had picked him up and he became a concert. Um, and so we ended up going to the Guthrie and performing with him in concert at the Guthrie um, as, as part of his show there. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating. Wow. So what's your future plans? What do you want to do? Well, you know what? There's a point where you go, do I want to ever be famous, famous? And I'm okay with where I'm at performing. I love performing stand-up comedy. I don't see myself ever retiring. If I can remember my act and I can do it, I just want to keep performing. Um, I'd love to be able just to make enough money so that I, you know, I'm comfortable. But um, I will, you know, I, I 
just I like performing. So it's one of those things. Um, the, uh, the the world according to ARP, uh, the uh, kick the bucket list show could become a nice big show. Like the it'd be nice to get what are those guys who do the um, the blue collar tour? Oh you yeah, have to get yeah. into something like that where you start. You hit, the casinos are picking this up already like crazy. So because it's a great show for uh, it's it's set it's set specifically for the baby boom generation with a lot of baby boom referencing and it's it, I mean other people can watch it and like the show they already have, but it really is set up for for that kind of things. So, you know, it's it's a lot of I mean, it's about getting old with a sense of humor and. Uh, People want to hear that. They don't want to go out, and they, they're afraid to. Some some of the older people are afraid to go to comedy clubs because they they don't want the vulgarity. They don't like the. You know, yeah, I get comments as people leave here because they expect something different when they come in here. I mean, in a in a bad way, they're expecting the vulgarity and they're expecting it not to be as clean as it is here. And it's really not. I don't instruct the comics to be too clean. It's PG seventeen yeah. and uh, no f bombs. Yeah, that's the rule. And uh, but and most of the comics come in here play clean. Yeah, you can be adult and you can be uh, mature without it having to be, you know, uh, vulgar. Now, do you sell the show to the casinos and wherever you're playing at yourself, or do you have somebody that does that for right you? Right now, uh, I've got somebody booking that show. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that is nice. So, And, uh, I mean, did you, is it an agent? Did you have to sell it to him, or did they see you someplace? I, he knows or? me from the stand-up comedy world, okay. you know, so I was able to kind of just say, I've got this thing, and I think, you know, and so he, he said, this isn't taking much to sell the show, by the way, so I'm going, cool. So we're, we're in the experiment, that we're going we're gonna to try, in fact, uh, next weekend, I'm doing the, my, uh, a, a theater um, and, and then a casino, and we'll see, then we'll kind of see how that all works, what works, what doesn't work, and then we we'll have another casino we're doing it. My, I mean, I can see doing this show like on a Wednesday afternoon where they bust, bust them all in from yeah, wherever, right. and they get part of the whole package, and you get to see the show along with uh, playing the, the slots and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, What's the name of it again in case when people hear well, this? It's called the, uh, kick, kick the Bucket List or The World According to okay. ARP. Okay. Now, there's a lot of re- you're moving down the floor. There's a lot of retirement. Um, not, and they're not sinners. They're um, villages, villages, and, and stuff like that. Right. And they have entertainers come in all the time. A lot of people, they're that age that come into this club here. So mm-hmm. they said, "Hey, have you ever thought about it? We live down there and coming down." So uh, I'm looking into that now. But is that is that a, a, a absolutely that's your market too? Yeah. I mean, right? That's yeah. The, well, it's smart because I mean, I, I if I want to continue doing this show, you know, and. and I, I was in a comedy contest a while back, and I realized that. And basically, I went. I was was there to let the agents know that I'm still alive. I missed it. You go, where have you been? Well, I've been doing corporate, so I've been. I'm not in the public eye very much. I'm more, not. I'm more in holiday parties and kind of stuff like that. But I said, I didn't know you were still. Yeah, I'm still doing it. That's like. But I wasn't. I wasn't mean enough. I wasn't dirty enough, you know. And I wasn't young enough for what they were looking for for their their comedy contest they were looking for somebody and actually didn't even want to win because the, the winner had to do like 26 weeks of work in comedy clubs they got all this great booking I said, that's right yeah. and i didn't want it i didn't want that i just i didn't i said a, a booking here a booking there would be nice um just i wanted to kind of refresh my face again but i was going you know and uh, it doesn't it, in I, contests are weird anyway you just it's so subjective and you go you know but that's not what i want i'm not, i'm just not so there's there's venues that I'm sort of deciding to get away from. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, you got to know what that's you why don't Florida want to. is probably a really good market for me. Yeah. Well, you know, I end every podcast with a tip. And uh, the tip I always give to somebody that's new or somebody that's been in the business and just wants to get better is it doesn't have anything to do with being on stage because I, I assume when I talk to people that you're going to work with your stage stuff. It's uh, being bold. So it's more on the backside. So what I mean by being bold is do things that nobody else is doing. So call the people that nobody else is calling. Uh, work the places that nobody else is working along with the other places too. But do things that are different and uh, do things that scare most people. And uh, sometimes you're going to get known, but a lot of times you're going to get a yes that because no, it's like dating. Nobody ever approaches the supermodel standing at the bar because they're oh well, she's with somebody or every guy is talking to her and then but she's thinking over there that nobody ever comes up to me be, because of that that's the same thing in business nobody ever calls these people nobody ever contacts them mm-hmm. nobody ever asks them questions so that's that's the recommendation I always give so if you could give a newbie or somebody that just wants to get better gets a, they want to get better in the business what 
is one tip that you could give them? Well, this is something that um, it's it kind of on the line of stand-up comedy, but when I teach the classes, I say, you know what? Most comics are trying to get laughs, and you know what what this business is about is giving the laughs. It's not about getting. It's about giving. You're giving the laughs. You have a, a present, basically, to give them. You are um, you're on stage, and you're performing for them. It's not, it's not they're coming to, they're coming to see you, but you, you're giving laughs, not trying to get them. Once you, once you realize that, that that's what it's all about, it, it can change your whole persona on stage and in life too. It's about, it's, it's really about giving. So, um, that would be my, my little, no, yeah, that's good. I agree with you on that. Two cent, uh, you know, thing there. So if people want to find out where you're at or to get a hold of you to book you, how do they do that? Well, they could find my website, which is just Scott Novotny with a Y, you know, dot com. Spell and that out for him. It's, it's Scott, S-C-O-T-T, and then Novotny, N-O-V-O-T-N-Y dot com. And you can see I've got lots of little uh, blurbs on uh, YouTube and things like that. They can watch me and get an idea. Um, and there's a, an agency called the G.L. Berg uh, agency out of uh, Minneapolis that has been booking me for a lot of the corporates. So and uh, so they can go through them as well. But if they they can always reach me on that that uh, website. I don't do a lot of like where am I at because uh, typically where I'm at is in corporates and so I don't I don't usually let people. The know. casinos that can come see you though, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, the casinos. And where are those dates listed at? Uh, yeah, on the casino sites, probably for okay. the most part. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's one of the. I've been a little lackluster about putting where I'm, where I am on my, because uh, I just had it changed around, and my web designer. I, I go, I don't. How do I? I can't figure out how to do it. You know what <laughs> I mean? I'm going. I'm. A, I'm at that age where I go. Eh, you know, I, my daughter he, put this app on for me on the phone. It's like boom, it's there. I could. That would have taken me like an hour and a half to figure this stupid <laughs> app out. And uh, so it, it's one of those things where. So I um like we're the the casino that we're doing is called the Wild Rose Casino in Emmitsburg, Iowa. That's the one coming up. Okay. And uh, and then there's one in uh, I don't know, Os- like Osceola, Iowa. Mostly the I it's like the Midwest casinos that are we're doing the show. Okay. But that that's a great show to come see me and uh, it's because and we're not only doing stand up comedy, but it's a little bit of there's some music involved with there's some singing, there's some video, so I I've I've really framed it in a theatrical setting. So it's 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 a it's you really it's a warm fuzzy. Nice. If you know what I'm talking about. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to get set up for tonight, and uh, we'll have a good time. And then you're, where are you off to after this? Back to Minnesota? To move. We've got uh, our house right now looks like uh, an episode of Hoarders. So, <laughs> we're yeah, we're in the throes of moving. So, this is sort of a nice respite for kind of like, okay, ready? Here we go. We're going to get back, and like the, the, the truck's pulling up, and the, the you know, it's, and then, and then uh, we basically, at the end of the week, that's when I go do the, we literally get in the car. I go to two shows with the uh, bucket list show. Yeah. And after the second show, Florida, we head all the way to Florida. Ah. So we're, the the house is gone on on that Friday that we're heading out. So it's a it's yeah, it's oh, cool. crazy. You know? Well, thanks again for doing this. Absolutely. And uh, we will uh, have a good time tonight. Thank you so much. 